Sea anemones are often the first creatures spotted in any tide pool. Their tentacles attract prey, stunning them with stinging nematocysts. The center oval is their mouth, which can ingest unsuspecting invertebrates and small fish. But before we're swept away with the tide, we should first define the different levels of the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone is split into three main levels. The upper marks the high tide line, and the lower marks the low tide line. Several creatures can withstand conditions in their neighboring zones. For example, mussels and chitons are often found in both the upper and middle zones. Sea stars can even venture from the lower zone to the upper to feed on mussels, but then must retreat at low tide. Organisms tend to be more soft-bodied in lower zones, and more shelled in higher zones. Tide pools can be found in both the middle and lower intertidal zones, often harboring the most diverse array of species. So let's dive back in and introduce some intertidal life. Of course, don't forget your dive buddy. We'll briefly pass through the subtidal zone. Oh, that was a stingray. Undulating through the water at incredible speeds, hundreds of stingrays find refuge in these sandy shores and use neighboring bays as nurseries. Flatfish also prowl among the seagrass, searching for prey such as mollusks, crustaceans, or even small fish taking shelter within the eelgrass bed, much like these juvenile striped bass, who will eventually head out to sea. Ah, algae, a clear sign that we're entering the lower intertidal zone. A school of clever cardinal fish are currently taking advantage of the high tide to forage. Many young fish reside at the edge of the subtidal and lower intertidal to utilize the constant mixing of nutrients from the tides, which in turn attracts more residents to this rocky reef, like this black surf perch looking for mollusks. And a rather cautious young adult kelp bass. Bright orange garibaldi are hard to miss, and the California state fish. Their juveniles have iridescent blue dots. A magnificent display of the brown gorgonian, including a crustaceous resident. Competition for space is a serious game where the stakes are high. Two different species of both gorgonian and brown algae are currently battling for this patch of rock. In fact, a plethora of algae is characteristic to the lower intertidal. If you look closely, other strange creatures are found spaced between the algae, such as this brightly colored tunicate who use algae as protection from desiccation during the lowest of tides. Back at shore, we'll explore some tide pools in the middle zone, just beyond that pier. And then, we'll move onward to the upper intertidal zone, near La Jolla Cove, just there. Scripps Pier marks our arrival to a coastal reserve that encompasses nearly 1,000 acres in La Jolla, California. On our way to the tide pools, a large cohort of bean clams begin to bury themselves to prevent desiccation during the impending low tide. It's the perfect time to explore the middle intertidal zone. Red algae appear to be far more prevalent within the tide pools, and more shelled species begin to surface. Several fish spend their juvenile stages hiding within these oases and return to the open sea once they are young adults. However, fluctuations in temperature and salinity presents challenging conditions within the tide pools. Crustaceans are abundant and can crawl between the intertidal zones in search of food, quick to evade predators within small crevices and tidal hideaways. Hermit crabs are voracious little feeders when given the chance, constantly moving in search of opportunity. They're virtually ubiquitous in the middle intertidal. Chitin are also common, but well hidden along these rocky tide pools. Other more fearsome predators are masters of camouflage. Extremely difficult to spot if you do not look closely. Let's head onward and upward to the highest intertidal zone. Here, oddly shelled creatures like limpets reside and feed alongside their crustaceous friends. Nearby are some strange sand structures eloquently built by tubeworms. Mussels do particularly well here, 
Though like all intertidal life, they are ruled by the tides. Sea stars prey on mussels during higher tides, only to be targeted by seabirds during the low tide. Other green creatures are less affected by tidal patterns, such as these lazy sea lions, who have effortlessly retreated atop these rocks just as high tide approaches. In Southern California, the tide rises and falls twice per day, every day. This is chiefly influenced by the gravitational pull from our moon. Many creatures must withstand constant changes in wave action to survive here. However, some coasts only experience one tide cycle per day, often with less dramatic tidal ranges. Let's properly introduce the different tidal patterns. We can look at the tidal patterns by plotting the height of a given tide against time, in this case, across one day. Diurnal tides have only one high and one low tide per day, while semi-diurnal tides have two cycles within the same 24 hours. Interestingly, mixed semi-diurnal tide patterns have high and low tides occurring at varying heights. Certainly, on any coast, the tidal range is far more dramatic during weeks of a new moon or full moon. Most intertidal inhabitants cannot escape the tide. They must be prepared to ride the wave. Due to the tidal patterns, Zonation has separated marine life based on their specialties and strengths and their limits. Despite these grueling conditions of changing wave action and threat of desiccation between tides, Many organisms thrive in the intertidal zone and call these tide pool oases their home. Hasta luego, amigos. Wait, I almost forgot. Ocean in the ocean.